Hi folks, this is Abel James, and thanks so much for joining us on Fat Burning Man, where we talk about real food and real results. On this week's show, we're here with James Wilson, an expert mountain bike trainer, and we'll be talking about how to move like a human, injury prevention, and myth busting at the bike shop. But before we get to the show, I have a quick shameless plug for our new and improved membership community, the Fat Burning Tribe. When you focus on eating real food, which just a quick reminder, should be plenty of veggies, high quality fat, and clean protein, as well as moving like a human, incredible things can happen. But do you ever feel like you're going at it alone? The biggest thing most people are missing when they first start eating real food and transforming their bodies is support from like-minded folks. So my wife, Allison, and I decided to create an online community to share our best recipes, workouts, and healthy living tips all in one place. We update the members area at least three times a week with new videos, recipes, articles, or exclusive giveaways. We have a super fun and inspiring community with members sharing their favorite recipes, answering each other's questions, sharing successes, and getting support through their journey to better health. And every month, my wife Allison and I hop in front of the video camera to answer your questions about health, fitness, and pretty much anything else. We have hundreds of members from all corners of the globe rocking out in the tribe. So if you'd like to join us, we've opened up a few spots for people who join soon to get the first month for just $1. Normally, it's $27. All you have to do is go to fatburningtribe.com. That's fatburningtribe.com. Com. Here are a few goodies that we've recently added to the tribe. A seven minute wild workout video and a handy timer tool where I walk you through the best exercises to tone your body and burn fat. A masterclass coaching video giving you the scoop on proteins as well as delicious fat burning meals like cowboy burgers, crock pot, beef short ribs, wild sockeye salmon with zucchini noodles, spicy buffalo chicken, and wild blackberry pie. That one's pretty rough. So that's just a little taste of what you get when you join the tribe. You can join today for just $1 if you go to fatburningtribe.com. So go check it out. All right, so on to the show with the mountain biking beast, Mr. James Wilson. We're going to be talking about how to prevent injury during training and competition, why bikers should train without a bike, how to exercise like a kid again, the value of flat pedals for improving your pedal stroke and skills, why form matters more than speed, and much more. All right, let's go hang out with James. All right, folks, James Wilson is the owner of MTB Strength Training Systems, a company dedicated to creating the best training programs for the unique demands of mountain biking. Since 2005, he's worked with several World Cup teams and riders and contributed to four national championships. We're here to debunk some myths about what effective training looks like and maybe even give you an excuse to exercise like a kid again. How's it going, James? Oh, it's going great, Abel. Thanks for uh, having me on. Really excited to talk with you today. Yeah, right on. So you're kind of a u unique guest because of the way that you've specialized your skills, but I think we really see eye to eye on uh, the overall approach to health and wellness, which is that we're fed a lot of misinformation about a whole lot of different stuff. And we think that things are one way when, in fact, they could be a lot more simple and uh, easier to work with in our own lifestyle. So why don't we start with a little bit of your story? I, I was reading on your blog that basically you fell over at a stoplight and clipped in, it clipped into your bike and wondered if that was the right way to go about all of this. So why don't you just give people the, the skinny on your background? Yeah, 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 for sure. Well, you're, uh, um, you know, touching on one of the more, uh, I guess, uh, infamous things that I'm known for, which is my um, stance on the value of flat pedals and, and the value of clipless pedals and, and how they benefit different riders and stuff like that. But I guess, you know, going back a little bit before that, I, I'm, I'm kind of what you would call an accidental mountain bike coach. I did not get into, I, I didn't look and say, I want to be a mountain bike coach. Mm -hmm. You know, I came up, uh, I started working out in high school, like most uh, kids uh, wanted, you know, I was skinny, wanted girls to look at me. So I started doing the bodybuilding thing. And uh, then I ran track for a little bit, so I got a little bit of exposure to how strength training can be used not only to build muscle, but mm -hmm. also to improve performance. Yeah. And, and so I had this you know, background and, and I liked training. Looking back on it now, I realized I had a little bit of a weird obsession with training. Like I, as soon as I got into it, 
I just started reading everything I could get my hands on. This is all back pre-internet days when it was just muscle and fitness and flex and muscular right. development. It was like you had to go to the store and buy things, you know. And so, uh, that. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so I just you know was reading everything I could get my hands on. And I, I remember sitting in the back of math class, like not paying attention to the lesson because I'm trying to figure out the perfect you know, three day body part split and how to, you know, I'm back there like literally writing programs yeah. in, in, in class, not paying attention. So looking back on it, you know, I realized like I definitely had an affinity for this stuff, a little bit of an unnatural obsession, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so flash forward a few years, I decided to become a personal trainer and I, uh, I got certified through the International Sports Sciences Association, the, the ISSA. Yeah. And they just so happened to have their uh, headquarters in Santa Barbara where I uh, lived. And so I took the test, but I went in and I, I met those guys. And so they knew who I was, did really well on the test, and they offered me an internship. An internship turned into a job. So I'm working at the International Sports Sciences Association, you know, as a trainer, got all this, you know, information and stuff at my fingertips. And then I get tired of driving to work. And so I decided to buy a bike. And I bought a mountain bike because it looked like a BMX bike, you know, yeah. like the road bikes just looked a little too skinny and weeny for me. And I wanted something, you know, looked a little beefier. Maybe I could jump off a staircase or something. Right. Or I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I, uh, I get my mountain bike and I just, you know, riding it to work. And one day I decide to, uh, one weekend I got bored and I decided to pedal up a fire road and, and ride it back down. And I was instantly hooked. I was like, wow, this is it, man. This is like. You know, you're getting the cardio high from like an endurance sport. You're getting the adrenaline rush from an action sport. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, it's just the best. Like to me, mountain biking is is just the funnest sport there, there is. I mean, yeah. like I said, it's that perfect combination between an endurance sport and an action sport. And so, uh, but with my background, I knew that one of the fastest ways to get better at a sport was to start you know, get my strength training and my training geared towards that sport. So I start looking into it. I start using the resources at my fingertips and, and trying to look around and find things. And I, I realized, like, man, there's a bunch of crap out there. Like, this yeah. is not it. Like, three sets of 10 on the leg press is not how athletes train. So I didn't know much about, like, quote, unquote, mountain bike specific training. But I knew that what I was finding wasn't athlete training, like that mm -hmm. I knew from my track background. So I decided to start uh, applying some of my own thoughts and and stuff to the to the process, and and over the years, uh, you know, came up with some ideas of my own, and and basically, like you said, it's it's really it's a lot simpler than than a lot of people think. I'm I'm a really big fan of uh, of Dan John and uh, and his work, and and one of the things I like about him is how he just takes complex ideas and, and makes it really really simple yeah. and. Honestly, like a training program, it's there to plug in gaps. And once you understand just what the basic human movements are and, and where your gaps are and, and what your sport, where the gaps in your sport are, like what is your sport not working? Like that's one of the things mm -hmm. that we mistake. We look at a training program and we think we should focus on, you know, what the sport needs. So if we're riding a mountain bike and that's an endurance sport, we need to be focusing all of our training on endurance. And it's like, wait a minute, every time you ride your bike, you're getting endurance. Guess what you're not getting when you ride your bike? You're not getting like full hip extension. You're not mm -hmm. getting, you know, these, these these basic human movement patterns. And so that's what you want your training program to focus on. So anyways, I mean, that's but uh, um, but, you know, just kind of that whole application of natural human movement to, to what you're doing, both in the gym and outside of the gym um, is really what I do with mountain biking, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, like you're saying, it's really I'm, I'm uh, you know, if. if, mm -hmm. if we transplanted places. Like I'm sure you would have a lot of the same experiences and ideas and stuff. I would. It's just you know if we're looking at this from a from a, a you know kind of a paleo natural movement, natural you know what is working with our bodies instead of trying to work against our bodies and force unnatural right. things on them that work in theory, you know, but don't work in practice. You know what would we do? And so um, yeah, one of those things is the uh, the whole like clipless and, and flat pedal things. It was. Uh, you know, it's kind of funny. There is a little bit of cult of authority when it mm -hmm. comes to uh, clipless pedals. And people just assume that there's this, you know, authority group out there that's like looked at all the information and ruled definitively on this subject. And that's why we say that clipless pedals are a must and that they're, quote unquote, better than flats. But uh, when you really look into it, you find out there's a little bit more of the story, just like with a lot of things in life. But um, yeah, so there you go with that with that rambling uh <laughs> 
uh, response there. Uh, we'll, we'll go from there. Well, it's so interesting. I, I haven't talked about this on the show, I don't think, but when I was growing up, um, I, I trained in cross country and did some races, mountain biking. And uh, a guy who I grew up close to, who's one of my friends, ranked, I think it was number six nationally in mountain biking. His brother was really good too. So I was just basically a hack trying to keep up with them. But that makes you pretty good and it's pretty really fast. Good. You know, yeah. you train with someone who's an absolute monster. But uh, when I first started mountain biking, it was always on flats and I loved it. And I felt like a kid and it was very free, you know? And you also, you feel like a human that's on a machine more than something that's kind of, <laughs> I, I guess, attached, right? You're, yeah. you're like too invested when you have the clip, clipless. But then, you know, you walk into a bike store, you upgrade your bike or whatever. And the first thing you're sold is clipless pedals. And so yeah. when I got on those things, I remember, you know, you have to learn how to use them. You have to learn how to mount, dismount. It's pretty Very gnarly, natural. especially when, you know, your knees are going all in this weird direction and you're yanking up on your pedals. You're like, is this really the right way to do it? And so for years, that's, that's the way that I did it. And uh, it was so refreshing to find your blog because if for the past year, I took up mountain biking again, but purely on flats. And I thought that I was you know, sacrificing performance or doing it wrong or whatever. And uh, like you said before uh, we started recording in this interview, you give people permission to use flats again, which is pretty yeah. rad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it is the, the industry just, you know, uh, stance is that clipless are better than flats, and it's just it's a black and white issue. It's the you know, and and what it stem, what it what it all here here's the problem. There's like people forget like what we think of as the as the modern bicycle. It's known as the safety bicycle. Like mm -hmm. before the 1880s, 1890s, uh, bikes were much different, and, yeah. and, and so the, the big the, wheel and the tiny the big one in the back. wheel, right, right, right. So it was a different, much different thing, and so. If you think about it, what we think of as the bike, what we know of as the modern bicycle is barely 100 years old. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's not that old. And then you look at like other sports like, you know, like, uh, you, know, you know, powerlifting, which has its roots in like strongman training, mm -hmm. you know, track, you know, wrestling. I mean, dude, some of these sports have, you know, thousands of years of history. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, and, and if, so when you think about it, it's like, dude, this, our sport is, it, it's really new. And so people forget that they looked at bicycle riding. I call them the original pedal stroke theorists, you know, and they were doing the best that they could with the information that they had, but they looked at the pedal stroke and they made some assumptions. Mm -hmm. They assumed that pedaling a bike was like running or walking. And so therefore you needed to push through the ball of your foot. Like when you run or walk. Yeah. And they also assumed that, they were noticing that when you attached your foot to the, when you when you strapped your foot down to the pedal and, and it could not move from the pedal that you were able to apply a little bit more force and go a little bit faster when you did that and they had to, why is that and their theory was well when you attach your foot to the pedal you can pull up on the backstroke now mm -hmm. so you're able to push and pull at the same time and that that extra pull is what's adding to that power and so. That's I mean, it's that that's the rabbit hole that yeah. the cycling industry decided to go down, and you have to rewind so far back for most people to get them to understand what I'm talking about. And it basically goes back to the original pedal stroke theorists were wrong. They made two critical mistakes. The first one being that your foot acts differently depending upon one thing. Does it break contact with the ground or whatever it's you know on, or does it not? Like when you're running, walking, jumping, whatever, your foot breaks contact with the ground. Mm -hmm. That's when you push through the ball of your foot. If your foot does not break contact with the ground, like when you're bending down to pick up a box or a kid, or you're sitting down into a chair, or you're in the weight room and you're doing you know a split squat or a deadlift or a lunge, everyone knows if you've ever been in a weight room, the first thing they tell you is, don't come up on your toes. Mm -hmm. Don't push through the ball of your foot. You want to make sure you're pushing through the heel and the ball of the foot, applying force through the, the middle of the foot. Right. So if your foot doesn't break contact with the ground, it acts much differently than if it does. On a bike, does your foot come off of the pedal? Does it break contact with the pedal? Yeah. No, it doesn't. You know right. what I mean? Like when you're pedaling, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And so 
that means that it acts more like a deadlift or a squat, mm -hmm. not running or walking. So you're not wanting to push through the ball of your foot. You're wanting to push more midfoot. Now, anyone who watches a kid ride their bike will see their foot automatically goes midfoot. They're, they're in the middle of their feet pedaling. You like have running. To, right, like running, right. You have to force your foot to stay on the ball of the foot. You literally have to attach your foot in some way to the pedal mm -hmm. to get it to stay on the ball of the foot because your foot naturally wants to move to that mid, more midfoot position. So you got to fight it. So there's that. And then the whole like pulling up on the backstroke thing. Again, this one drove me nuts because people talk about it like it's fact. Yeah. And they, they talk about like you, you just do a Google search and you'll be able to pull up five studies on the thing that, that just definitively prove that this is what's happening. That's not the case. It's crazy. There is not a lick of science to support pulling up on the backstroke. In fact, every bit of science that actually exists, and there is science that exists on this stuff and people mm -hmm. can get it through my Flat Puddle Revolution Manifesto on my site, points in the opposite direction says that you want to pedal your bike like you run or walk, not, not, in, not in pushing through the ball of the foot, but with the leg action where mm -hmm. we power lower body locomotion. That's what I call it. It's not running, walking, pedaling a bike, you know, whatever you want to call it. It's just lower body locomotion. Our body is made to create lower body locomotion through a strong push with a more passive pull simply to reset the leg to push again. It's like in, in running, if you try to pull up too hard with the trail leg, you can actually start to interfere with the with the running stride and decrease yeah. the efficiency of the running stride because your body's set up with these passive mechanics, a strong, you know, down a, a strong push with one leg, flexion of the hip, triggers an automatic um, extension of the hip, sorry, on one side, mm -hmm. triggers an automatic flexion of the hip on the other side. It, it happens automatically. You don't have to think about it. And so when you try to override it and think more about it, all of the science, everything that's out there points to you pedal with less power and you burn more energy to do it that way. And so, and, and when they look at the pros, that's not how they're pedaling. What you're getting again is this, ask a pro what he's doing. Like, who's the worst person to ask how to do something? A professional, because yeah. they usually don't know right. how to do what they do. They can describe what it feels like. And so when you're talking to a professional cyclist and he's like, oh, when I'm getting that spin and it just feels effortless and it feels like, you know, the, the way that he describes it sounds like he's, he's pulling up on the backstroke, but when mm -hmm. they actually attach them up and look, that's not what's happening. So people are sold. They're told right off the right out of the gate that you need to push through the ball of your foot and you mm -hmm. need to pull up on the backstroke. Those two things are impossible to do if you don't attach your foot to the pedal in one way or another, either through yep. the old school toe clips or through the clipless pedals. Mm -hmm. So based on that rabbit hole, based on that logic – Clipless pedals are better than flats because you can't get your foot in the right position and you cannot pull up on the backstroke on flats, which makes them inferior to clipless pedals. And that's pretty much what everyone's told and how they're sold on clipless pedals. And I'm sure you probably heard something very similar to that when you got into mm -hmm. clipless pedals, right? Yeah, for sure. Well, yeah, that's, you yeah. walk into pretty much anywhere that that is involved in sports and you're sold something immediately right and <laughs> technology yeah 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 well, that's one of the things i like about brazilian jiu-jitsu which i've been doing for the last almost three years is right on technology has no place in it you know right. what i mean like no one thinks that their gi you can spend as much money as you want on a gi and no one thinks it's going to do crap for you on the mat yeah. so it's, it's actually a very refreshing change for me from the, the tech heavy mountain biking world where mm -hmm. everything is a technological answer. It's like, you know, in jujitsu, if you have a problem with something, they're like, get better, dude. Like <laughs> yeah. the process, like you need to drill more, you need to get fitter, like whatever it is, it's always comes back on you mm -hmm. to be the one that takes responsibility for your performance, not technology. But uh, so anyways. And form over strength. So let's talk about that yes. a little bit more because you, you touched upon it earlier that a lot of the approaches to performance in sports, for example, will be focusing on the exact thing that they're using in that sport. So if you're biking, you're only really strengthening those muscles that are involved. You're not really focusing on the mechanics of the whole body as a natural human as much. It seems right. like your approach is much more based on uh, strength overall, mobility, functional 
type of yeah. approaches to all of this. Can you talk about why that's important as opposed to a more kind of specialized laser focus? Yeah. We're right about all of this all the time approach. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely. That's a really good, uh, uh, really good point because you're right. People think that what they use the most in their sport is what they should just keep working all the time. And, and there was two things that kind of influenced me that, uh, this way. There's a, a guy named Ian King. He's an Australian strength coach and honestly, he's probably the godfather of modern day strength coaching. Most of like, like the, the movement planes, hip dominant, quad dominant, mm -hmm. push, you know, vertical, all that stuff. He was the first guy to talk about that, first guy to talk about tempo. But he had a really good point. And it, it's what is the point of a program for an athlete? It, you, you, only one thing can be most important. Is it injury prevention or performance enhancement? You can yeah. only pick one. And his point was that, you know, it needs to be injury prevention because over the long run, an athlete who is injury free is going to be able to practice more consistently, mm -hmm. play more consistently, train more consistently. And those things are going to add up over the long run to create a better athlete uh, than simply always focusing on performance enhancement and doing this whole like, you know, two steps forwards, one and a half step back thing where you train right. really hard until you get hurt and then have to take time off, train really hard until you get hurt. So that was a, a real early influence on me was this thought of like, you know, if I'm hurt, it don't matter how fit I am. Yeah. So you got to look at your training program from a little bit more holistic approach from that standpoint. And then two, just the more that I got into, you know, natural human movement, just what a wonderful organism the human body is and, and how nature really has figured all of this out already. And, and it, if we just learn to work with it rather than try to impose our own ideas on why something else should be better, you know, like the whole barefoot running movement, you know, mm -hmm. we thought that patting the heel to lengthen the stride would be better, you know, it, 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 and, and so when we try to outthink ourselves, so just keeping the body moving well and, and and I'm really just about man just be a good human and then yeah. learn how to apply that stuff to a mountain biker like I tell people like you forget you're not a mountain biker you are a human being that mm -hmm. rides a mountain bike and if you neglect the human being side of the equation and focus solely on the mountain biker side again it's going to it may give you some short term results like over if we're just talking 12 weeks yeah. Yes, just focusing on performance enhancement may produce better results than what I'm talking about. But if we're talking about 12 years, you know, like I'm, I'm approaching 40, so I've been doing this stuff long enough to realize like over a long enough timeline, this stuff catches up with you. Yeah, It does, and there's no avoiding it. And you can either, you know, recognize that early on and, and, and take measures into your training program and how you eat and how you live your life. Or you can get ready to pay the doctors and the surgeons a lot of money when they're trying to fix this stuff because mm -hmm. it's gotten beyond the point where the body can heal itself and 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 take care of itself. So, do you, do you have any examples of that? Like one one approach, one person who's done this for a while with a focus on the the longevity side of things as an athlete, as opposed to someone who might have gotten those short term gains, more of a horror story. <laughs> You know, it's, I mean, unfortunately, I think that anybody who's worked in this industry long enough sees that, will tell somebody, I wish you would have come to me before you got to this point. Right, yeah. And and I think that honestly, like, that's that's the thing is people come searching for answers usually after it's almost too late, you know? Yeah. And so it's really, it's, so I, most of what I do is help put people back together. Like I very rarely get someone who is uh, just a, a blank slate. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I mean, I guess like in, 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 in as far as like that specific uh, of a, you know, I don't, I have a, there's one guy in particular, I, I'll kind of going back to the flat pedals thing actually that, that I will, uh, um, you know, comes to mind and he was literally ready to quit riding because of how bad his body hurt. Yeah. And he was doing nothing but just riding his bike and, and if you ever did anything, it was cardio and just, you know, all bike specific stuff, mm -hmm. you know, no stretching, no mobility, no, no strength training to work other movement patterns, nothing like that. And, 
he, literally the words in his mouth when he came to me were, I'm ready to quit riding because I hurt so bad after a ride. And this wow. was a really highly accomplished rider. Like his claim to fame was he rode all of the major trails in Moab, Utah in one 24 hour period, Jeez. which is insane. Yeah. People don't mountain bike. Like Moab is one of the meccas of mountain biking. Right. And yeah, like that's an insane feat. Yeah. I so, got my mountain bike I, there and that place ate me alive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's the real deal, man. So, but anyways, it, it's a so really high level rider. This wasn't like some dude who you know, uh, um, you know. And he tried the bike fits. He had tried all of the, all of the other stuff. And I, I told him to just you know do a couple simple things. So I'm start adding in a uh, a quad and hip flexor stretch, doing some foam rolling. You know, I just gave him a couple simple stretches and mm -hmm. mobility drills. I told him to start doing the strength training, but he he didn't you know, want to, you know, do it as much as he probably should have. Yeah. I told him to do one simple thing. I told him, switch to flats and stand up to climb more. Because mm -hmm. that's another thing that, you know, that people don't think about. But like seated pedaling, and this is another myth in mountain biking, cycling in general, is you want to keep your, you want to stay seated and only stand up when you have to. Right. I, 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 I say, man, you don't, what you don't want to do, like we were talking earlier, like, you know, if, if sitting is the new smoking, yeah. Like cycling is like doing bong hits of crack, <laughs> you, you know, that is a tweet right there. <laughs> like I, I, and again, I love cycling. I love mountain biking. Sure. I don't, don't get me wrong, but it, it is when, when we're told like, you know, it, I, I look at things through, through a lens of tension and on the bike, there's high tension mode and there's low tension mode. Mm -hmm. And anyone who's mountain bike knows exactly what I'm talking about. Like when you got to kind of lock down and start creating some tension to keep the pedals going, mm -hmm. you know, uh, low RPM, high torque pedaling is such an important part of mountain biking, which is something that most people don't really train for because again, right. you know, yeah, but like, yeah. I don't like the term cyclist in general. To me, it makes as much sense as the term ball sport athlete. Yeah. You know, like just because two people are using a a, a, a bicycle doesn't mean that they're the same athlete. So yeah. usually cycling is code word for road riding. Yeah. Let's just be honest. Right. And so road riders approach riding much differently than the mountain bikers True. do. And, and for them, a low RPM, or I mean a high RPM, low tension spin mm -hmm. You know, may be preferable, but it's it's also a reality. It's doable on the road. On the trail, you don't get that luxury. You right. never get the chance. Where you're, you're constantly having to switch cadences, a lot of high torque, low RPM stuff. So when you get in that high tension mode, stand up. Like if you're to look at two postures on the bike, standing up. And when you stand up, most people don't stand upright. Like they standing up, you want to shift your hips forward. You want to get your 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 shoulders on top of your hips. Like you want to stand up. Like mm -hmm. when you stand up on your bike. It should feel like running. Like I heard uh, Bruce Lee uh, in his book Jeet Kune Do described running as feeling like your center, you're, you're chasing your center of gravity. It's just in front of you, but you never quite catch it. Right. Yeah, it's perfect. That's exactly what you want to feel when you're running, right? That kind of, you, it's, it's a controlled fall, basically. Mm -hmm. And that's what you want to feel when you stand up on your mountain bike. It should feel like running. And so when you get your, your shoulders pulled back and down, your spine straight, your shoulders on top of your hips, hey, guess what? All, we're all worried about uh, getting our, our seat height just dialed to the millimeter because right. we need our knees, blah, blah, blah. Guess what happens when you stand up, people? Full knee extension. Yeah. You don't have to worry about that stuff. Plus, you get the co-contraction at the knee. This is another thing most people don't think about. When you stand up and you pedal, you get that full knee extension, but you also get the co-contraction of the hamstring and the quad at the knee to stabilize the knee mm -hmm. as you use the hip to sweep the foot back through what's known as the dead spot. When you're uh, sitting down, you don't get that. You don't have the pressure on the foot. So your your knee never actually gets that co-contraction and stabilization that it needs while sweeping through that downstroke. So when you're in high tension mode and you're trying to apply power to the pedals and you're seated and you're applying a, sh ton, a ton of... Uh, uh, <laughs> trying to keep it PG, but uh, you're you're applying a ton of of stress through the knee in, in an unstable position. Yeah. It doesn't matter how dialed in you get your bike fit, your knee is always in an unstable position because you don't get that co contraction. As soon as you stand up, that co contraction happens. You get full knee extension. Every your body works so much more naturally when you're standing. So mm -hmm. I try to encourage people to use standing pedaling. In high tension mode. So when, when you're in low tension mode, hey, sit down, spin. Nobody's saying right. you got to stand up all the time. But it's just yeah. when things start to get hard, don't just like lock down in that adult fetal position. 
putting all that unnatural stress, like you're just locking yourself in that that crazy position. Yeah. So, anyways, all that to you know, uh, you know, just again restore natural movement to the bike. Let the let the foot move more naturally. Let your body move more naturally on the bike. And in less than a month, he came back to me, and the the guy that was formerly ready to quit uh, says his pain's all, all gone. Wow. It's like pretty much all gone. He's like, it's it's amazing. And and that, that was the only thing. He did some stretching and mobility work, and he changed the way that he approached riding his bike from this, like, the biggest lie the bicycling industry ever got us to believe was that pedaling a bike is different. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You've heard this. Like, it's always like, well, pedaling a bike isn't like, you know, in the weight room. It's different. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's not like running or walking. It's different. You know, that's when I try to explain to people, man, it's, you know, you just want to push. Like, oh, well, riding a bike, it's like, it's not just because you threw your leg over a bike doesn't mean that all the rules of functional human movement got thrown out the window. <laughs> I'm so but glad you're saying that. That's how they approach it, though. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's like the the I have a blog post on this, and and what it is, it's it's the mechanical. There's a book, uh, Anti Fragile. Have you read that one? Yeah, yet? that's a great one. Oh man, I love that one, man. That is like one of the best books I've ever read. I read it twice. Because life it so is hard, and you need to make yourself better at that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't wish things were easier. Wish you were stronger, right? Yeah. And. Uh, but, you know, in that book, he talked about the difference between, you know, a mechanical system and an organism. Mm-hmm. And, and that's one of the problems is, is, is that people have looked at the bike and they've said, okay, if I was designing a machine to power this bike, what would I have it do? Okay, now let's make the human body do that. Not human body optimally moves this way. How do I apply that to the bike? Mm-hmm. That's what I do. And that's that's the big, big, huge difference in what I do versus what most people in the cycling industry do because you're, you're usually taught that you want to approach it from the other standpoint mm-hmm. of forcing the human body to do unnatural things in the name of some mechanical theory of why this should be better than what the human body naturally does. So and that approach, your approach, is it's more freedom. It's more opportunity for thinking. Right, it, yes. it like brings the sport back to it in a way. Yeah, yeah. Well, it makes it more natural. Like when we were a kid, you know what I mean. Like yeah. when I was a kid, I don't remember worrying about cornering. I don't <laughs> remember about standing or when I should stand or when I should sit. You know what I mean? I don't remember worrying about pedaling. Yeah. Then I become an adult, and all of a sudden I'm told by another adult, ah, you know, everything you knew as a kid's wrong. Mm-hmm. You know that that we're we need to pedal like this. Don't stand up. Sit down. You know what I mean? It's like it wasn't until we became adults that we were told to to start riding differently. Everything you're doing is wrong. Yeah, we, you, yeah, yeah. You're doing this wrong. But it's the yeah. It's it restores a natural movement. I've actually I've started a a, a bike skills camp and you know kind of uh, based on what I'm doing. Cool. I'm, I'm, I'm you know not advertising it to the public. Yeah, I'm doing a couple of trial runs to get it dialed in with some uh, with some customers and stuff. But anyways. I call it the primal bike skills camp because cool. my theory with mountain biking is this, that if you have those primal movement skills, your push, pull, squat, hinge, uh, you know, loaded carry and, and groundwork, you know, just going off of the Dan John uh, list of stuff, which in my experience works pretty well. You know, so those basic things, if you have those building blocks, those primal movement, primal movement skill building blocks in place, it makes learning these higher level sports skills way more natural and mm-hmm. way more easy. And what most people, what most mountain bikers, because increasing your technical skills is one of the top things for most adult mountain bikers. They right. want to get better at their technical skills. What they're battling is not a lack of knowing what to do. They're battling their own bodies because they have these gaps in their movement skills. Like if they don't have a hip hinge, then they, they can't get into good body position on the bike. Like they, if they don't, have the ability to, you know, hinge at the hips and not the lower back, then they can't spread their weight out properly on the bike in order to get in the position that they need to. And so you can't fix that on the bike. You have to fix that off of the bike. And then once you've fixed it on the bike, it'll happen naturally on the bike with a little bit of coaching, a little bit of thought, but it's not this like mind bending process that most people put themselves through to improve their skills. Mm -hmm. So any skill you want to do on the bike, there's a basic human movement pattern behind it. And if you own that movement pattern, then learning the skill, like perfecting the skill, mastering the skill is a completely different story. That's your 10,000 hours. That's your, you know, years and years and years. But if you have the fundamental skills in place, 
you should be able to pick up uh, a skill pretty quickly. You know, I call it the 10 to 15 minute rule. I, I use it in the gym too. If I get mm-hmm. someone, I'm trying to teach them kettlebell swings and I'm sitting there for more than 10 minutes still coaching the living crap out of them, they're probably not ready to do kettlebell swings. Yeah. I probably need to move them back and they don't own a previous step in the, in the pattern there. And so people don't look at the fact that these high level skills on their bike are just an extension of these primal movement skills that they need to have off of the bike. And so when you fill in those gaps and you own those things, man, riding your bike, it's just so natural. It's like being a kid again. Yeah. You, you ride the bike based on feel, not thought. You know, you're right. not thinking step one, step two, step three. You're just naturally able to feel and flow things that is really hard to describe when you have these gaps in your movement Mm-hmm. That you're you're trying to figure out how do I work around this dysfunction, not just able to let your body just go and flow and be free. Oh, so man. I love that. Yeah. yeah, you know, I I had a really interesting experience because when I was uh, younger and doing athletics more seriously, focusing more on performance, it was all about thinking, you know, and and trying to focus on the technicalities of everything. But I took some time off, you know, in my early 20s because I wasn't really an athlete anymore, right? And, right, and right. then took these things back up and ran marathons and uh, started doing mountain biking quite a bit again. But focusing on form instead of, you know, just raw performance numbers or whatever. And the interesting thing that happened is, is once I really got my form down in running, <laughs> well, at first, when I looked at what my form was, when I actually looked down at my feet as I was running and filmed myself, you know, running, it was ugly. My yeah. right, I had no idea that my, uh, you know, my knee was all torqued on my right side and my foot was kind of like flopping around every time I put my foot down. I think if we're honest with ourselves, no matter what type of movement you're doing, if you're not focusing on form, if you haven't cleaned it up in a while, we're all yeah. kind of guilty of yeah, that. Yeah, so, yeah. But when I got back on my bike after not doing that for, for years and cleaning up my running form, I noticed that my biking form was so fluid and so natural. Like you were saying, it's just something that kind of extends naturally out of the yeah. way that you would move anyway, as opposed to grinding on it. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, exactly. It's, I mean, really, like I said, it's, it's lower body locomotion. And, and once, you know, running to me is actually one of the best ways to clean up and refine, especially your standing pedal stroke. Because mm-hmm. again, like it, it, your, your posture, the sensation, the movements, are very similar. And again, like, you know, there's, there's just, there's that separation of like your foot doesn't act like running or walking because it's not breaking contact with the pedal, but the rest of your body acts like running or walking because that's just natural human movement and and lower body locomotion. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So that's where, again, people got to keep these two concepts separate in their head. Like why it is like running or walking. So, you, you know, that's one of the best ways, you know, running will cleaning up your running stride will help your pedal stroke, yeah. uh, um, but you don't want to be pushing through the ball of the foot when you're pedaling because of that, that other aspect there. But no, you're absolutely right. It's, it's, it's understanding how to, you know, I, I, I got a, a couple, uh, been at this long enough to come up with my own terms for a couple of things. That's when you know you're a real guru and you start coining your own, <laughs> uh, your own crap. Um, I call it barefoot pedaling. Yeah. And, and, you know, it really is at the end of the day, it's not like barefoot running or walking. It's not about necessarily running barefoot, although some psychos take it to that point. Sure. It's just about restoring natural movement back to the activity. And that's really what I try to do and encourage people to do. Yeah, just get people to, to look at, you know, restoring natural human movement to the bike. And, and there's this huge disconnect between, you know, if, if you, you sit down and you talk about movement outside of the context of, of cycling with with these a lot of people who coach and work with cyclists, they would totally agree with all these things that I'm saying. But as mm-hmm. soon as you you put it in the context of cycling, it's really weird. Right. You know, they have this domain blindness to to these things. They're so wrapped up in their own, and they've heard it just so many times and took it as truth that uh, you know they don't critically think about it. Unfortunately, so right. And it just you know, it, it, it in my experience, it just it takes a lot of fun out of riding. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you approach it that way, because I did it for the first, you know, several years of riding, I did the same thing. You know, it was, it was uh, you know, sit down and pedal and push through the ball of the foot, and like you know, all of these things, and it just, man, my body hurt, and I just didn't feel like I was riding as well. So, um, yeah, yeah, get away from that stuff, man. And like you said, it's like 
being a kid, man, being able to ride your bike like you're a kid again is really the ultimate goal. Ride like a kid again. I love it. All right. So we're just about out of time. But before we go, James, why don't you tell people uh, where they can find you and what you're working on now? Yeah, yeah. They can find me at uh, bikejames.com. Is, uh, that's my blog and you know all sorts of information there. You can get a free 30-day uh, you know, program to check out you know, how I combine mobility and strength. And, and you know, Really, one of the things that I like to do is help people understand how what they're doing in the gym and the movements and stuff apply to the bike. Because yeah. when you understand that a deadlift isn't just a deadlift, it's a way to practice the basic uh, you know, body position on the bike things start, you know, going differently. And, and, and so to me, um, understanding how to make those connections between the exercises and the movements is real important. So I try to do a, a, you know, a explain that through the, the blog and the programs and stuff. Um, but yeah, you can also find my flat pedal revolution manifesto there for anybody who's listening and has some, uh, curiosity questions about the whole clipless and flats thing. And like I said, I've got, uh, links to several studies that uh, back up what I'm saying with the pedal stroke. There's a, an EMG reading in there that back up what I'm saying. And so, and, and I have an open challenge. It's been open for years for anyone to, and again, like I, I did not come into this trying to prove that clipless were better than flats. I came into this honestly. I was like you, I, I assumed that I was holding myself back with the flats thing. And I started asking questions because as I started working with higher level riders, I wanted to know well, how do I help train them to enhance the clipless and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So I started looking into it actually to help figure out, well, how are clipless pedals better than flats? So therefore, I can create training programs that that can enhance that. And that's when I start. That was my first problem is I started asking questions. <laughs> and, and that's when that's when the my, this whole thing started. And so yeah. anyways, my point is, is that, uh, you know, if, if someone has some information that, that contradicts it, I'm always open. I, I, I have an open invitation. You know, hit me up at James at bikejames.com if you've got something that, that points in the opposite direction that we do need to pull up on the backstroke or something like that. But uh, after several years, I've never had anyone send me anything but more information that backs up what I'm saying. So yeah. um, there's a trend there. But anyways, you can find out more stuff there with the Flat Pedal Revolution Manifesto. That's, that's my big passion right there, man, is, is helping educate people on uh, – um, you know, kind of free their mind and free their feet a little bit. Yeah. And so, uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that's it. And I'm actually, I will, uh, I guess I'll, I'll, you know, I'm working on a new project that should be done by the end of the year. I've got some new ideas on, uh, on, on a flat pedal that I'm working on. So it's a nice. completely new take on, uh, on it. So yeah, I'll, uh, I'll definitely hit you up and let you know, uh, get you a pair so you can tell me what you think. When I yeah, that think. sounds great. That sounds great. I, I can say that, uh, after doing it both ways, I, I'm having a great time with the flats these days. It's just so much yeah. fun. I'm riding like a kid again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, again, I, I know we, we got to get going. I don't. I keep belaboring the point. But I just, you know, to me, clipless puddles are like a weight belt. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? It's like they're like a weight belt for your feet. And yeah. does a weight belt help you lift more weight in the gym, all things being equal? Yeah, probably a little bit more. Mm -hmm. What does that make it better? No, there's a lot of subtle levels to that argument, you know what I mean? And really, you can become a really good lifter and really strong and never use a weight belt. Mm -hmm. You know, so the same thing with flats. It's like you can become a really proficient rider training raw. That's what I call it is like pedaling raw. raw. Yeah. yeah, 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 you know, and then you can use your clipless pedals and that'll enhance your good form and technique. But, uh, but man, that's what the, you found out what a lot of people do is like, I can be really good and have a lot of fun on flats and I really don't need to worry about the clipless puddle thing. But unfortunately, that's what the clipless puddle industry doesn't want you to know because <laughs> then they'll stop buying their pedals. Yeah, so, totally. Anyway. Well, busting some myths again. I really appreciate it, James. This was awesome. Thanks for coming on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, no, it was, uh, it was fun, man. Definitely enjoyed it. Awesome. Hey, this is Abel James from Fat Burning Man, and if you liked this video today, please take a quick second to subscribe to this YouTube channel. Now, I have a quick question for you. Do you want to learn how to get fit and lose fat by exercising less? Get the step-by-step -step strategies for how to do that right now for free. All you have to do is subscribe to this channel right now, then click the link below to fatburningman.com. Enter your best email to sign up for my newsletter and I'll send you a quick start guide to burning fat right now and some ridiculously good recipes as a special thanks. Once again, just go to fatburningman.com right now and enter your best email to get your free fat burning download straight to your inbox. Talk to you soon.
this harkens back to the Atkins days and why so many of the low carb crowd um, are holding on to pounds they don't want to. I felt this when I lost my first baby.